Hello, gem enthusiasts. Today, we are going to be continuing our lecture on corundum, and here going into the blue gemstone sapphire. This is a very well-known gemstone in our culture, we'll, and we'll start off by talking about it. One of the aspects of sapphire in our culture is it's known as one of the big three, right? And it is the most attainable and available financially of the big three. Financially available, big three. It just costs less than ruby or emerald. Another aspect of its culture is that the demand for blue sapphire has increased over the last decade or so. As white gold and platinum, white gold and platinum have been used more and more in as a metal in the jewelry industry, we've people have recognized, designers have recognized that the blue color of sapphire complements the white of the metal very well. Here we see an example of that complementing in jewelry. This is an image taken from the GIA and in today's lecture I'll take some images from GIA, others from Lotus. Oops, let's go to the pen. So this one is from GIA, Gemological Institute of America. We're also going to have other images from Lotus and others from Wikipedia, because these are the sources of my information, and these are educational sources on gems that I'd recommend you to. As we go through sapphire, I think the most important aspect of it is going to be color. So we're going to go with big B here underneath culture is going to be color and other optical properties. We're going to call that optics. And for color, there are actually many different colors possible in sapphire, but when we think sapphire, we always think of blue, aka this color blue, which is why we're using blue ink in today's lesson. So blue is the primary color. And with color snobs out there, there's all these different variations and hues that are possible. And with sapphire, you can call it a blue sapphire if it has a bit of a violet blue to ranging to a green blue. All these are going to be acceptable hues of blue. If it's not within that range, then we need to call this a different type of sapphire, which is called a fancy sapphire. And we'll get to fancy sapphires a little bit later. So blue is our primary color. There's a lot of different names for these colors. We talked about some of them earlier in the semester. There's words like indigo and cashmere. And uh, what's another really pretty word for this? Ooh, cornflower blue. That's a really popular color of sapphire. In fact, that's like the top blue color. And these are just trade terms for, and so let's see, what, we did this. We went here, here. These are trade terms. They have meaning to people in the industry. We don't need to use them here if we don't want to. But if you ever heard, hear these, they're just referring to different shades of the color of blue. The top blue is this. Cashmere, and it's synonymous with cornflower blue as well. Oftentimes, this cashmere blue, oh, my notes are getting a little sloppy here. There's a bit of a velvety, a velvety luster to a cashmere blue. And I have a picture here also from GIA to show a top cashmere blue. And you can maybe see that there is a kind of a softness to this blue color that's coming from an assortment of different fine needles of rutil that give it a velvety texture. Maybe this is a slightly more, um, I don't know if you compare them, this one has more of a purple to it. All right, let's go to pen. We need pen. There we go. Pen is there. So what is causing the blue color? So the blue color is caused by chromophores, and in this case it is colored by, the blue color is from Fe2+, plus, the reduced state, coupled with iron 4 plus. And what these two things together do is they substitute in the crystal lattice, substitute for aluminum 3 plus. And the 2 plus and 4 plus end up finding a charge balance for that 3 plus. The more iron you have, the darker the shade. More iron 2 plus produces a darker color of blue. So something that's lighter like this, velvety cashmere might have more titanium in it and less iron. 
The other thing about this then is we can think about source because iron, we learned this in the Ruby lesson, iron comes from basalts. And so be, basalts have iron. And so sapphires that come from basalts are probably going to be darker colored sapphires. Whereas those that form in marbles that are poor in iron are going to be the lighter colors and perhaps more valuable colors because if you get too saturated and the tone becomes too dark then you lose the beautiful color now there is many other colors of sapphire possible and we're going to we call these generally speaking these are called the fancy sapphires and they are called sapphires so if you have a stone that is yellow or pink Right, or green. The color for that is like a yellow sapphire, a pink sapphire, or a green sapphire. All of them are possible and all of them have lots of value to them. The most expensive of all the different fancy sapphires is called Pod Parasha. And this is a hard one to spell. Pod Parasha. And Pod Parasha is a beautiful color of pink orange or maybe we use the word salmon to describe this color. It's named after the lotus flower that, I'll put one in here, this is a lotus flower that I grabbed off of Wikipedia. And the color of the tips of these petals is where the Padparasha name and color stems from. The, the color of this ends up rivaling in cost both ruby and blue sapphires. It's highly, highly sought by buyers. The color of Pod Parasha, this pink orange color, comes from an addition of chromium plus iron in the crystal lattice. We're going to also put here that this is the most expensive fancy color. When I say most expensive, we're talking something like a, a few, like a thousand dollar plus per carat. A normal fancy color, a yellow, a pink, a green, these things may be 800 to a thousand dollars per carat for a smaller colored stone. Pod Parasha, it's going to be more than that. So maybe like a thousand dollars plus per carat stone. Another color, it's not fancy, is called Gouda kind of like the cheese, but spelled differently. And this is a cream-colored sapphire. And a cream-colored sapphire, like a white sapphire, this is worthless. And for many years, at least, that's what it was. It was worthless. We're going to put that down. It was a worthless co color that was found amongst stones that had value. And they found a lot of it until they realized it could be heat-treated to produce a color. was worthless until treatment recognized. And nowadays, much of the blue sapphire that is bought is actually Gouda that has been heat treated to turn a blue shade. Those are two that I want to draw your attention to. Other aspects of color with sapphires that we should talk about is color change. This is a pretty wild phenomenon. Color change. And We've talked about how color change works before, but the stone looks different in incandescent light versus daylight versus sunlight. So let's say this, let's say, and, and it, it's caused by chromium and vanadium chromophores that absorb light, all right? That's the mechanism that's causing it. And the color that we see depends on the spectral composition of the light. And so let's let's put this phrase down. Spectral composition of light. We worked on this in an earlier lab this semester where we looked at sunlight. And sunlight produces all the spectra, right? The sun has all the spectra. But a fluorescent light, it doesn't, right? A fluorescent light, we looked at it. It only produces light in these bands. And so the chromium and vanadium chromophores could absorb some of those bands differently than the, the all the wavelengths that come through. In fact, we could do it like this. Let's say we're absorbing 
and we're absorbing. And as we absorb the yellow light, that's what ends up being absorbed by these. In fluorescent and sun, the resultant thing that we see is different. All right, so that's what color change is and how it works. Let me prove it to you here. Here's another picture from GIA. It looks like I've been using GIA a lot for this lecture. Here is an image of some beautiful color change sapphires, where we're seeing them in fluorescent light on this side. And then here we're seeing them again in incandescent light. And they show up from blue, and they change in color from blue to this more pinkish red. This is a very valuable phenomenon, and when it does occur, the stones will sell faster. Now, a couple other aspects that we should talk about. Uh, number four is that color zoning is very common in sapphires. If we were to draw color zoning, we could draw part of a crystal, and then what we would have is, as growth occurs, there's going to be different bands of, like, darker blue, we could color one in, darker blue band, and then a light band, and then a darker blue band, and a light band. And it's controlled by how the different constituents that are available to crystallize are available in the rock. Okay, so it color zone is very pop. Let's say, let's just say that it is uh, changes in growth conditions can affect color. Here's an image of color zoning in a blue sapphire from the Lotus educational uh, webpage. And you can see very pronounced color bands in this blue sapphire. They'd fade together when you look from far away, but when you zoom in closely with a microscope, you can see the darker and the lighter bands. Most of the color zoning that we do see in sapphire ends up being going from white to blue and green. These are the different band colors that you should expect to see. And then the last thing for this mini lecture today is gonna to be the effect of inclusions on sapphires. Inclusions, like always, can have both positive and negative effects. The One of the most positive effects in sapphire, which might be strange, is remember that, that velvety luster that occurs in cashmere sapphires? I'll zoom, let's see if I can find it. Here it is. That velvety luster, which is highly sought after, has to do with the alignment of very, oh, close. That velvety luster is produced by very fine needles in the crystal. It's, oftentimes this is called silk. And it ends up giving the color just kind of a stronger appearance to your eye. And so it's sought after. Of course, another pot, so that's a positive. Another positive of inclusions is that it can tell you where the stones come from, right? So it gives you information about the geographic source. And then finally, the last thing that inclusions can do that is also a positive, of course there's negatives, right? The negatives, we'll put, we'll put a negative down here. A negative is that it will impede light, right? And we don't like it when they impede light. But the other positive is that it can produce very fine, very beautiful asterism in the form of star sapphires. And we've talked enough probably about how asterism occurs. We don't need to go over it again. But here, let me show you an example from Wikipedia of one of the finest and largest star sapphires that exists. Let's see. Here it is. There's the star sapphire. This is called the Star of India, and the Star of India is a 503 carat, let's see, 563 carat blue sapphire with very pronounced star that's forming, right, remember from the same same reason as from the ruby lecture, as the, uh, we've got these rutile needles inside the, inside the stone that are reflecting light, and they will end up giving you this beautiful flash to your eye. All right, well, that's the end of this mini lecture. See you again soon as we talk about sapphires and their geographic sources.